thanks for inviting me. Good to, good to be here and see you guys. All right, so I guess I'm here to talk about uh, animation, my career. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been an animator for about 18, 19 years now. Um, I'm pretty much exclusively in games. Um, and uh, mostly that was a choice out of, I started off wanting to be in film, but um, the realities of uh, having kids, like I, by the time I was, I did kind of a career shift. I used to, I had a former career working in advertising and didn't start animating until I was about 30. Um, and then just, uh, and because it was a while ago, it wasn't as easy to learn animation. So um, to, I was pretty much self-taught. So it took me about five years to put together a demo reel, um, like working days and then coming home and learning how to rig. There weren't even like free rigs back in the day. Um, so I had to learn how to like rig using weird clunky tools and uh, make animations. And then um, I got a job offer in the Bay Area um, to work on my first game, which was a terrible, terrible game called Celebrity Deathmatch, um, where the company imploded halfway through working on it. But it got me out here and into the industry, and it was really exciting. And I'm still actually good friends with all the people I worked with uh, back then. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, the problem with um, games, uh, the good thing with games is they tend to, um, the projects tend to be a bit longer. So you're basically there settling in for a couple of years, uh, whereas film is much more transitional where they just kind of really need to ramp on and off. Um, and that was a challenge to do with uh, young kids. So um, I ended up in games and uh, love animating. I definitely seen the industry change quite a bit, um, which has been interesting because uh, when I started off, it was most companies were about forty people companies for like around the PlayStation Two days, and uh, it, it was interesting because you could do a lot. You, know, you could, um, if you wanted to do some effects, you could do them. You um, could kind of jump in and be a little bit of a jack of all trades. In fact, they most a lot of places they weren't even like animator roles, they were game artist roles. And so I'd go places and they'd be like, all right, could you model the hero character? And like, no. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I ended up specializing in kind of rigging and animation. And then after a while, I deliberately let my rigging skills fall off because I'd end up having to kind of come in and do a ton of rigging on a project, which is then my reel wouldn't be as good because I'd be doing all the rigging, but um, it's also become, that's another area where it's become so specialized so um, mm -hmm. in, in an interesting way, because now people are, you know, effectively programmers and like high level problem solvers. And so um, I, always have a, I always have a soft spot for riggers because uh, they can make your life so much better. Um, but, you know, it's also important to know how to do these skills, like the, basically the more you can do, the better. Um, all right, so it's a little my first first ramble. Um, I don't. I like to talk. Can about I jump in and ask, some that. people may not know what rigging is. Do you mind describing what rigging is? Sure. So rigging is when you animate a character. Um, if you open up Maya and you're ready to go, someone's had to set up this character for you. So it has basically a skeletal system inside it where. You know, each joint is, you know, to move a hand, there'll be just like a, an underlying structure of joints. And then there'll be usually a duplicate skeleton with controls to let you move stuff around. So it's this big kind of feat of engineering to uh, do some, uh, you know, to, to make this a, a digital, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, all right, it's got a question. Get that in a minute. Uh, but basically, it's setting it up a digital puppet. And it's basically this kind of half art, half science um, way of doing this. Um, so, yeah. So, and walk track. Um, Monica, point me in another direction to talk. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you started with your career at the very beginning. You wanted to do film, but then decided to go into games. Now, is it something because it uh, you landed you landed into games by you know just by 
uh, purpose or by accident or how did that, how did that transition happen? You know, it was kind of funny. I was um, back in the day, I just was animating for fun. I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I kind of, um, it was in the early days of 3D where it was more accessible um, to you, like basically having to do it on your home computer. Um, and before it was like, you'd need like a Silicon Graphics workstation, a Maya, and that was like 40 grand for that package. So unless you were at a place where they had that and you could learn it, um, you kind of we all had to wait a few years until we could get software that was uh, more accessible. But it was also pretty clunky. But so long story short, I ended up doing this little like stop motion style piece just because I liked Wallace and Gromit and stop motion. And um, I got a job off. Someone looked at it and said, hey, do you want to interview for this job out in California doing uh, working on a stop motion game? We really thought you nailed the style we're working on. And so I flew out to the Bay Area from New York City and um, uh, accepted it. <laughs> Moved out here and took a massive, massive pay cut to start my career over, like in my early 30s. Um, but it was really exciting, incredibly fun. Um, Nowadays, though, um... Uh, I think you mentioned it was a little while ago, but now um, do you feel like education and knowing the animation like stop motion or 3D animation, do you feel like you have to cater to certain companies to be able to apply to those jobs? Or how do you feel about, you know, learning the skill and the, and the needs of the company? Well, that's a really, really good question. So it, in the early days, you could be a lot more of a generalist and you could kind of just figure stuff out as you go. Now, because there's so many schools out there and there's um, the industry is a lot more mature, um, you really, like say if I was gonna work, like I'll give you an example. So I've worked at a bunch of places and what I've kind of done is I jump back and forth. I'm much probably better at cartoony animation and that's more my skill set because that was my interest going into it. Um, but I've jumped around back and forth between motion capture, high level realism jobs, because there's more of those out there, especially at the higher, the higher levels, but like the AAA titles are generally um, more like that. So I tend to, I don't have just a standard demo reel. I basically have a lot of animation pieces that I assemble and target to each company I'm applying because it's really specific now. Um, and I learned my lesson because uh, years ago, I like really wanted to work at LucasArts and work on Star Wars because, you know, an animator who doesn't want to work on Star Wars. And so uh, I just put together my reel, stuff I thought was good, but um, the, I, what I didn't research was what they were working on at the moment, which was a very highly realistic game. And so they assembled a team of really realistic animators and... Um, I showed my cartoony reel and the lead just looked at it, didn't say a word, got up and walked away and someone said interview's over. And I was like, huh, that was kind of sucky. Um, but it taught me a lesson, which is, you know, show work that's appropriate to the company you're applying for. So if I was going to apply to Industrial Light and Magic, I would show a very, very realistic um, reel. I would show edited motion capture. Um, and I would show it at the level. They, they pretty much want to see like stuff that looks like a shot from one of their films, um, at least you know a good enough uh, attempt at it. Not with the lighting and everything, but they want to see the motion that's um, solid enough. Um, if I was going to apply to Pixar, I'd show really, really well done acting pieces, um, and so on. If I was going to apply to a game animation studio. Um, that's when it really pays to do your research about what um, what sort of job it is. Because in the old days, I used to do a lot of like game cinematics. I do a lot of cutscenes. I do in-game animation. And um, that's become really stratified. Uh, a lot of those all are outsourced um, or there's individual cinematic teams within it that are separate from the regular animation team. Um, when I was at Crystal Dynamics working on the Avengers, that was easily, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest team um, 
I'd ever worked on, there was maybe 30 to 40 animators. Um, and it was like a film production and they had gameplay animators. Within the gameplay animation department, there were um, guys who worked on the hero characters, guys who worked on the enemies um, and dealt with uh, AI and movement and logic and work with some of the programmers to get good movement systems. And that's a little more what I worked on <coughs> because um, I tend to be a little more technical than a lot of animators. So they often put me on stuff that's not as, um, you know, flashy, but if, you know, for a game, having an enemy move in a not very interesting way um, is, isn't really fun because, you know, you could have like the strongest punch in the world, but unless you have a really good reaction to it, it's not going to feel good. And so um, I kind of, over the years, became more specialized as a game plan there. And that's, I guess, what I'd call myself at this point. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, really, it, it's, um, uh, especially because of the amount of people out there looking for jobs, I kind of feel like um, you really have to do your homework. And, um, you know, and this is, I'll digress a little bit. This also, you know, if you guys are interviewing for internships and things like that, um, and this is just kind of a general life skill, um, like people, if you're interviewing, um, it's really good to be proactive, come in with questions um, that show your interest, that show interest in what you're doing um, or in what the company's doing. So if um, I was interviewing, someone for an internship and they said, so I really like the games in this company from here to here to here. Did you work on any of those? Like what, and ask, you know, questions about those and show that they, um, they've done some research and are interested in what my company was working on. Um, and it's a good, it's also a good icebreaker, but you know, so you're not just sitting there quiet in an interview waiting for a question to be asked. It's kind of, I think, good to, come in with a plan of attack of like, so like, for example, when I uh, interviewed at Crystal Dynamics, um, my boss was like, yeah, I've been here for you, like 19 years. So I was like, wow, so did you work on like this project and this project? What did you do on that? Um, ask him about some of the like, you know, and I was generally interested because I've followed these games for years and asked him like, when did you guys um, like step up your technology, this and that? Um, and it was actually a really fun question, because, a fun interview, because I uh, got to ask questions that, like, I always wondered about. And, um, you know, and uh, I didn't play a lot of it. Like, I didn't have, you know, I didn't play their last game, but I'd go through, like, and that's the good thing about YouTube, is you can just do walkthroughs and go through it all and get a good sense of what it's about. But I would say, um, uh, you know, other than having a good attitude and being someone that you'd want, they would want to work with, um, you know, showing interest. And, um, and that goes for handling your reel, like handling your reel to, um, you know, for example, if someone from I, like Industrial Light and Magic said, hey, we're working on this project with um, dragons, um, we might have some spots opening up in a few months. I'd probably, and I wanted to work there, I'd sit there and I'd start animating like bats that day. And, get really good at it and um, build a reel, like build some like example pieces to put onto my reel that show that like, hey, I heard you're working on some dragon things. Here's all these like bad animations I did um, where I like explored the movement and flight. Uh, because that would, um, you know, it's, it's kind of doing your homework. I think that's really good tips, like doing the research of the company, making sure that you know what um, what games are being released, knowing yeah. what type of technology they have, if you can find it, uh, just being ready for the interview. I think that's really helpful tips if uh, if and when people get uh, interviews. So thank you for that. Um, sure. Michael Curran has a question. Michael. Awesome. Hey, Monica, thanks for doing this. Uh, Jeff, thanks a ton for being here. Um, sure. Uh, I'm the head baseball coach here at Ohlone and teach kinesiology. So uh, uh, I'm not a big video game guy, but I got three boys with me right now who are fired up to, to see us. Awesome. So I appreciate you a ton. Um, hey, two, two kind of practical questions. Um, yeah. I guess they're wondering, um, we're getting ready to send a couple of them off to college pretty soon. Uh, number one, what do you recommend? Maybe they study at a four-year institution. And then number two, on a practical level, 
how they kind of get in the business. What are some internship places and what are some things you recommend to help them do what you're doing someday? Um, that's a good question. Uh, those are all good questions. Uh, and I have a son who just started college this year too. So I, um, hmm. uh, I, I think for animation, it's really specific. It used to be, I actually don't think you have to, like if you want to get into animation, your degree does not matter that much. Um, I would probably like as much art anatomy, like art matters, anatomy matters. Um, you know, any anything helps. But for uh, to get an animation job, the only thing that matters is a demo reel. Um, degree doesn't matter. No one's asked me my GPA. Uh, I was a second career, so I have an English degree. Um, and I have a master's degree in painting. And that got me into like photo retouching and work in advertising. But um, no one has ever asked me what my GPA was or anything about my educational background. All they care about is my demo reel. Okay, so be kind of very similar to um, if if I get if I get film on a uh, you know a, a, a picture, uh, I, yeah. I I want to see what this kid can do. So you guys want to take a look at maybe what he's produced and what what they're kind of doing, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on, like I said, on a practical level. Um, you know, once they're done with college, how do they kind of how do they kind of break in? Uh, is it internships? Is it uh, just pounding the pavement and looking for companies to interview with, or what? What are your recommendations there? Um, connection, networking. Okay. Like networking is the single biggest thing, because just sending out it's like making cold calls. It's um, you know, uh, it's. Like, I, I think this is kind of how the world works and not a nepotistic way, but I think people like some kind of connection. Um, and it works both ways. I actually got hired by a oh, oh, student of mine um, a couple of years ago. It was just like, like, oh, my teacher, like, old teacher is great. I learned a ton from him. He'd be really fun to work with. And that was a good experience. But I think, um, you know, like, a, like looking for like internships is uh, like getting a reel together, getting some work together and just applying early. I think internships, there's a narrow window of like, you don't start applying in like April. I think by that time they're all taken. So I think from like January, you start really applying for internships and it doesn't have to be somewhere glamorous. You know, it doesn't, I mean, obviously if you're getting an internship at Pixar, it's gonna go well for you professionally. But, um, you know, I, like, I would, uh, you know, find places that you like or, or nearby, um, you know, uh, in the Bay Area, there's tons of studios nearby and just start uh, calling their HR departments or emailing, finding who the HR person is on LinkedIn and email and say, like, I'm a student, um, really interested in the internship, um, could I apply? And a lot of places, they may not have a formal internship program, but they might be like, yeah, we got a lot of work. We could probably use a little bit of help. Why not get some students in? Um, so I think being proactive, you know. You know I, I, like, I appreciate that. Very, very helpful. And um, good good to know as a, as a dad that I don't have to search for, uh, you know, certain universities that have this certain very specified uh, major. Um, Cause I think they're interested in one might do engineering, one might do business. And um, you're yeah. saying they'd be, they'd be fine doing that. And as long as they've, you know, got a reel and, and stuff like that. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Hey, I appreciate it very much. Thank you again. Um, let's see. There's some comments saying internships are usually for students going to school. I think that's correct. Yeah, it's it's also easier to get it's easier to get an internship if you're a student. Um, a little bit more about networking. Another way that you guys can network is going to conventions. So, for example, we're very lucky to have a GDC, which is Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, and that one is huge. So it's a really great place to not only know what's going on in the industry, what future trends are, but also it's a great place to meet 
recruiters, uh, artists just like you, and just make connections all over, like all the time. So um, definitely take a look at conventions like GDC, uh, CTN, uh, CGraph. Those are all really great places to find people that are just as passionate as you are and also make connections. And you can also uh, um, volunteer for a lot that's of right. places too. Another thing that I noticed, this is Isabel, is, uh, you know, meetups. There are mm -hmm. meetups all over. Uh, there is a, a game design designer meetup uh, in, um, actually in San Jose, which is super cool. Like, you know, it's usually 30 people and they all work in the industry. Um, so I highly recommend going to those meetups because they're always looking for people there. All right, Jeff, so I have another question for you. So you started sure. off at um, Celebrity Deathmatch, and then yes. somehow you end up working for Star Wars, Mafia 3, Avengers. Uh, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that journey? Sure. Um, so I was at a company that was folding. I moved out here. I had a um, kid on the way. And uh, I got a job down the road at a place called Stormfront Studios working on who had just come out with the Lord of the Rings game. And so, um, and that was a very much more stylized, it was kind of like Devil May Cry level realism. And so I jumped onto that. It was a bit of a sweatshop. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm actually, I think I pulled my LinkedIn. So yeah, so I worked there and did a little bit of freelance and then ended up at a really good company um, called Shava Games, where I worked there for about two and a half, three years um, before that also um, imploded and <laughs> fell apart. Um, and that was really fun. I worked on some Tony Hawk games. Uh, I worked on a Shrek game. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it started off not super high profile. It was an Activision studio, and they kind of have a history of, like, inflating their studios to, like, a massive amount. Um, and so it's a really different experience working on a 40 person team versus a 250 person team. Um, the, uh, so that they weren't really capable of like scaling up that fast and they couldn't handle the project. So that place imploded. Um, but it was a really good, great experience. I got to like do um, meet all these like skateboarders that I like saw from like time I was like a little kid and, um, you know, uh, I did the uh, the PlayStation Portable version of this Tony Hawk game and launched it, and it was it was exciting. There was a lot of really good things there. Um, uh, from there, I moved on to um, uh, Sega Studios, um, which was originally called Secret Level, where I worked on a uh, Golden Axe, and uh, that was a very realistic game, all mocap, um, but the mocap wasn't usable because of the way they shot it. And so um, I ended up working on the hero character, which was a pretty uh, cool thing. I, I um, never did, like done that before. So that was a big kind of feather in my cap. Um, and um, it was great. And then uh, Sega Can I ask them. you yeah. what motion capture is? Because you say mocap and I don't think people know uh, what motion capture okay. is. <laughs> so motion capture, that's a good question. Um, so motion capture is when they put someone in a suit and physically record their move movements, then you transfer it onto your character. Um, and so it's pretty much all big realistic games now all use motion capture. It's become much, much better. And um, a lot of places, like when I was at Crystal Dynamics, they had a motion capture studio right on the floor. And so they had a bunch of people that were really athletic on the team who would do like most of the motion capture and then you know hire like martial artists and things to come in and do specialty stuff uh so it was pretty it was pretty interesting um and it's a uh, it's a really different uh skill set um uh it's a really different skill set to um uh what was i going to say to like to edit motion capture um because there are these big long files and you have to kind of speed up the timing and still preserve a sense of realism and it's it's a whole thing um i don't know if that answers that 
it's a uh, it did thank you but it's one of those things where it's worth actually um downloading some free motion capture and like playing around with it and trying to edit it just to see what it's like because it's a uh, it's it's a uh, it's like using your animation skills um in a more technical way but it's super it's a super important skill to have and so um i actually man it was actually kind of interesting because they had a, a thing where they had one button mapped to the motion capture and one button mapped to my moves and they were trying to decide whether they were going to go hand key or motion capture and so fortunately they went with hand key and so it was a more fun project for that but um yeah, I mean, motion capture is it's here to stay, and it's you know it's important. I would say it's a pretty vital skill to know how to edit as an animator. Um, were I to put together a more realistic reel, I'd probably have some mixture of motion capture blending into hand key back into motion capture to show like that you that I could work with um, uh, a level of realism that was as good as motion capture and could fill in the pieces between motion capture. That's great. Do you mind if I show your reel? Go for it. And you can talk a little bit about it? Yeah. So um, this is Jeff's reel. And just to demonstrate some of his amazing skills that he has, this is from Wild Beyond. Maybe some of you guys have played this. So the music's very cool. I'm going to go ahead and mute it. Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about this, about this animation? Yeah, that's not showing up on mine, but I know what it looks like. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, Yeah, so basically this oh. is the first. Actually, that's a good game. question. Does anyone see it? Yeah, it's showing up for me. Okay, great. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this is basically um, was the first mobile game I worked on. Uh, and it was pretty challenging to work in mobile, um, surprisingly. Uh, and there were some good and bad things about mobile. Um, it's mobile games are a different culture than game like traditional game studios. They more have the culture of like a tech company. Um, however, um, it was really fun working on these like charming little, you know, cartoony models, and just trying to like inject as much entertainment as I could within them. Um, so that was a, a pretty fun thing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, it was mobile companies are different than, I mean, I think the real speaks for itself. They're just sort of like silly, charming little, and or attempting to be charming little animations that make you want to play the game. The actual gameplay animations are not interesting at all because they're like so small on the phone that you can barely tell what's going on. So we, there wasn't really that much to do for those. Uh, but so you spent all your kind of budget on these little kind of interstitial character moments, which for an animation animator is really fun. But um, yeah, but mobile companies are really different because they really have the culture of a tech company where they're constantly running metrics on what you're doing constantly sending it out for testing and giving you feedback that's um, like, does this animation, uh, will it sell more things? And it's, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird uh, kind of way to work because a lot of times your creative direction isn't coming from creative, but coming from testing and focus, like focus tests. And that can be, um, I, I never really got used to that because uh, I'm not convinced that testing's accurate enough. Like it's hard to um, it's hard to like quantify is my animation charming enough to sell more units of whatever they're trying to sell. Um, I, I don't think it 100 percent works, but uh, they have all these you know Ivy League data modelers who are really convinced that's how it goes. And so you just kind of roll with it and make changes. That's, that's also another thing. When you're working for someone else, um, you really have to be flexible about making changes uh, 
for the sake of the project, even if you feel like sometimes I've made my animations worse to make it more consistent with the rest of the animations. Uh, and that's kind of what your lead is. I would say like, my best advice is to trust your lead animator. And when they're asking you to make changes, don't be defensive about it. Just um, make those changes gracefully. And, um, you know, that was all, like, that was one of those things when I started off uh, as an animator, it was um, challenging because you get to a point where you get your animation pretty good and then you sort of have this fear that if you make a change, you're not going to get it that good again. And um, then I was like a little resistant to making changes because it's like, yeah, I don't know. Because in my head, I was like, I don't know if it's going to get it to that same level. It might just be worse. And sometimes that would happen, but as you get more experience, that's not really so much a worry um, because you can make it good. And um, generally as an animator, the more you work on it, the better it gets. And that's just kind of how it goes. Um, and often just, uh, you know, trusting, basically, um, generally when better, like more advanced animators give you feedback, um, it can be kind of liberating because they're basically helping you solve your problems and just giving you a little list. Um, it's funny, a friend of mine, he's uh, head, like he's one of the lead animators at Disney and he got his start at Blue Sky and it was, they'd hire like tons and tons of interns and um, apprentice animators and uh, a lot of guys would just be like, or women, they'd just be like, get these changes and be like, yeah, I don't know, I don't agree with that. And he'd sit there and his attitude was really humble. He just wrote down everything they said, made all those changes, and he said, they just basically gave me this list of how to make my animations more awesome. And um, he got a staff job there and his career has been spectacular ever since. But um, that's, I guess, my other advice I'd want in part is a sense of, you know, humility in being receptive to learning and making changes. I think that's a good tip. Um, it looks like Sam, Samuel, you have a question? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, firstly, I want to say, Mr. Cooperman, thank you for being here and uh, providing this presentation, everyone. We really appreciate it. I have a couple of questions I wanted to run by you since you're a veteran in the industry. Um, so just a, a little bit about myself for context for the question. Um, I worked as an intern at Ubisoft in San Francisco. Okay. I worked on the community management team a few years ago. Um, during the launch and live phases for a couple of their games like Watch Dogs 2, For Honor, uh, okay. Rock, Rocksmith, um, Mario Rabbids. And so my overarching goal back then was I always wanted to get into level design. Yeah. So I returned to school and I'm a computer science major currently, mm -hmm. although, you know, things changed. So now I've kind of uh, taken a passion into graphic art. Yeah. And so um, I, I really like designing logos and visual design and uh, I... I want to be a graphic artist, but I don't really have traditional art skills like pencil sketching or painting. Um, I'm kind of better with software and I'm a little more technical, kind of like how you said um, sure. about yourself. And so I wanted to ask you, what advice would you have for someone who wants to work on games as a graphic artist? You know, is there room on a game dev team for someone like, uh, like me? Um, and maybe there's uh, some standard software you could recommend learning, something that's uh, accessible with minimal barrier to entry. Yeah, well, I would say, I mean, actually, I have a former background as a graphic designer. So that's what I did. Uh, my background was I went to art school for painting. And um, that led to kind of being a photo retoucher in the advertising industry. And uh, as I was there, and there was a need for it, I kind of basically learned graphic design through just a lot of hard work and just um, being in the right place at the right time and getting the opportunity. Um, I, I think um, graphic design, well, the thing is, like, when you say graphic design, there's no graphic design for games. There's um, UI design, there's UX design, and then there's the graphics that come with texturing. And so uh, my, without knowing any of your work or background or experience, um, I would say, um, you know, you could always like, I mean, I think like education isn't something that stops. Like having a computer science degree is not gonna preclude you from being a level artist. 
um, I, I think you can bring all your skills. Basically, you can play to your, I always encourage people to play to their strengths. And so if you have an interest in doing like logos, do lots of logos and then figure out where that's going to fit in. Um, I mean, you could design, like what I would say is do something like the Unreal Engine um, or Unity and like build some environments and build some, um, make a lot of like posters, like make a shopping mall with a lot of cool designs and posters. Uh, design an environment that you think is really cool and appealing um, with things that you like in them. And I think you'll probably find a way to make that work because, um, you know, like level artists, some are architects, some people have come from different ex like experiences, but I think if you're making stuff that's compelling, um, you'll be able to find a way to do it. Um, I like to do things with it because um, a lot of times with games, there's a lot of like invented branding that goes with things. Um, if you look at things like, I don't know, think a game like Mirror's Edge or something where they have this whole like futuristic city and they basically had to invent kind of this graphic language of products and things that are all just invented. Um, I don't know. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that was very insightful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. I got one other quick question, um, yeah. which may not have like a clear cut answer, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. Um, in terms of the process, um, do you have much creative control over your animation and the direction you want to take the art, or do you have to fulfill requests that come from the, the dev team, or how does that work? It varies, actually. It's a good question. Um, I, I actually, I hit a point in my career where I would rather have a job that gives me a little more creative control than... Um, a place like, I mean, for example, like the Avengers project, I, I took that because I knew it was a high pro profile project. It would look good on my reel. Um, it's impressive. It'll, it's more marketable. But the work was a lot, like there was not a lot of creative control over what I did. There were some, I did some pre-visualization of some of the superhero finishers where I'd have like Thor like rise in the air and like throw a hammer down and dive down and grab it and then smash a robot or something. So there were some, but not a lot. It was more just the execute, like the creativity was in the execution. And a lot of times the motion capture was shot and I was just kind of editing it and I was responsible for timing. Like right now I'm working on this like cartoony golf game and, um, I have full creative control over it. Like they'll basically say, all right, here's this mermaid character playing golf. Um, have her kind of seem like she's in the water but playing golf and do all these moves. And so um, I get to be pretty inventive with it. And that's just really fun. It makes for a satisfying way to spend the day, if that makes sense. But it varies. A lot of times um, when I've worked with other companies, um, there'll be, say, like a combat designer. Um, there's like this guy, uh, Marcus Aero, who used to work with the Sega, who also worked at Ubisoft. I think he worked on Watch Dogs. And he would um, have some, like, he was like a martial artist and had some clear ideas of what he wanted to do for the combat. And then I'd kind of like, he'd, I'd say, well, look, you know, you know, martial arts, I don't, I'll video you. And then let me block it in and put my own spin on it. Um, some places are, more like matter of fact they're just like we need a an area of effect animation so have them like s the character smash the ground somehow um so it varies it varies on the um the structure of the team the roles of people and um what they're looking for cool thank you appreciate it sure Thank you. Um, I did find another one of your reels is a little it's a little older, but I still think it's got some charm. Um, just to demonstrate some of the the cuteness here that, that you have done in the past. So um, this is your 2014 reel. Okay, cool. I can even see it now. Can you or you can't? I can. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about quadruped versus biped animation? And, and then you also have like, uh, robots as well. So how do you, um, do you find one more challenging than the other? Do you, um, um are there any little tips you would recommend? 
Sure. I mean, with quadrupeds, well, it's all challenging. I mean, um, let's see. Uh, well, quadrupeds are, fortunately, there's a lot of reference for it. And there's some like systems of doing them. But basically, um, uh, I would say like figuring out, like just being a student of motion um, is kind of what you need to do. If you want to do, learn how to like, if someone says, can you animate this lion? Um, and if you just sit down and start animating without referencing anything, um, it's not going to work out for you so well. Um, and so um, I do a lot of studying. What I would do is actually, I had a little system where I would um, take little um, almost motion, I would basically take some video and I'd stabilize it of like, say like a rhino walking and I put little dots on, and it physically I'd put it as a plate in Maya. And so I'd have like a, like dots going the pattern of like the, the ankle and the knee um, and then some like spheres for like the front of the chest and the back. And then you can kind of see, get a sense for the speed of it and almost abstract it into just like motion capture almost, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I mean, it depends on there's in these little, uh, um, some things you can't, like if you're, someone says animate this dragon, there's no reference for dragon. But you could like look at how a large bird flies. You can look at how a bat flies and study the wing pattern, and then um, uh, see how that works. And so I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I learned a lot of I learned that technique from a guy who was a really good creature animator in Industrial Lights and Magic, and he was like much older. He was like in his sixties and, uh, but he was super enthusiastic and he viewed everything as a learning opportunity. He's like, anytime I get to be a creature, it's this chance to go in and like study how that creature works. Uh, I saw a couple of questions here. Do illustrations skills have any relevance in game animation? Uh, yes. What's it like to be a character designer using those skills? Um, well, character designer, um, has uh, well, I would say basically, if you are a really good 2D animator, you have a huge leg up on over most animators. Um, I sometimes just to keep my skill sharp, uh, and you know, and I'm someone with like a fine arts degree, but my I was never I was a good painter, I was never a great like hyper realistic artist. Um, and my 2D skills, I was someone that had to like really draw a lot to keep my 2d skills sharp um or and like i couldn't just sit down and get a likeness of the face i'd have to like draw every day for hours to kind of get my skills to that level um but i do a lot of drawing for animation um and a lot of uh things that really are um, let me find a link uh let me find a link for you guys it will be interesting um While you do that, I've noticed that you mentioned Maya a couple of times. Is that the primary software you have been using uh, while you've been an animator? Yes. Uh, that's pretty much become industry standard. Uh, when I started, it was uh, 3D Studio Max and Maya were the kind of um, like the, the two things that they were um, uh, split between. Uh, and this be kind of become Maya. Hmm. Now, because you use motion capture, do you also use motion builder or do they, um, do yes. they already, they, oh, you do use motion builder too. I've okay. used motion builder a lot. Some places, whereas at LucasArts, our lead decided we shouldn't use Maya at all. We should only use motion builder. And oh, we wow. have a whole pipeline around motion builder. And no one was happy about that. <laughs> um, because it's not as precise a tool, so it's hard to get like really accurate poses. Um, so I just sent this this link out, and um, uh, if you look on, I think Flickr 
there is, um, oh yeah, there we go. I found it. Uh, Victor Nabone, who's a pretty famous animator, as much as any animator's famous. Um, he does these really amazing, um, really simplified like sketches uh, for his, um, it shows his like planning process. And this is about the level I draw for my animation. And sometimes I'll use little um, 2D uh, um, animation tools. I'll like just practice little like bouncing balls on my phone just to keep my skills sharp. Um, but what, uh, what I think um, uh, 2D skills are really uh, good for, uh, not good for it, but where it can really give you a leg up is um, line of action and doing sketch over. So what I'll do in my process, this way I'm doing something cartoony, is I'll do my animations and then I'll go in with like this digital grease pencil and I'll sketch over my poses and make them better because it's easier to make your poses really shine doing something kind of hand-drawn versus um, uh, not, um, if that makes sense. Um, That's great. These are beautiful. So, so yeah, in the yeah. chat, everybody, you can find the link in the chat. Um, let's see. Jen, you have a question? Jen Oliver? Yeah, hi there. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Cooperman, for taking the time sure. um, to meet up with us. Um, so I, I asked this earlier, um, but I guess the, the chat kind of just scrolled through. Um, yeah. Going back to uh, networking, how would you go about networking during the pandemic? Because I've noticed that um, unless it's someone uh, that you know, um, a lot of people don't really look at emails or reply to emails from strangers. I think that's true in non-pandemic times, too. I think that's like why... I, it's a good question because I think about um, if I lost my job, how would I get another one right now? Um, and that's something that fills me with dread because I'm like, crap, because I can't go out for a drink with somebody and, you know, meet other people on their team or, you know, like it's, it's, it's just a challenge and it's something we're going to have to all deal with. I think finding a way to, um, and I don't know, I don't know if um, Facebook groups or, um, kind of Zoom meetups are the way to do it. But I think, um, uh, you know, I think, I mean, in the old days, there was this um, thing, an informational interview, where you could just ask for a, kind of a, like a, almost like a test interview where you meet someone and say, you know, um, you know, like, uh, find someone on, like, online or somewhere and say, um, look, I'm a student. I'm trying to break into the industry. Um, would, it, would you mind having an informational interview with me? Take a look at my work. Let me know what you think. Um, any suggestions of how to target myself more effectively? Um, and that can be a good way to, um, you know, like, that can be, uh, like, that's kind of how I got my start when I didn't know people in a certain industry. And it became a good way, like that ended up being kind of helpful down the road because you're basically just having a conversation with someone and they're more inclined to have some goodwill towards you, especially if you then go back, work hard, show them your work, say, hey, I took your advice, did this. And that's kind of like, those are kind of the ways like one can get a mentor. Um, and it's not, there's no cut and dried way to do it. Uh, and I'm just kind of sounding stuff out. Um, because I, I don't really know. Um, I don't know the, um, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone knows because it's such a weird time. The one thing people do have now is time. You have time and captive audiences. So if you can find people that are willing to speak with you, um, they, it's easier because they're home. They have, you know, like I'm working today, but I can take an hour and chat with you guys. I don't have to go anywhere. To do this and it's pretty easy to fit that in and so on the same note i'd be if someone said hey, would you mind uh having a zoom chat like talking about my work and some suggestions for my career i'd be happy to do that uh, to somebody no one's ever asked me that but um i i think finding 
ways. I mean, I think, you know, it is, it's being resourceful and um, it's being resourceful and being personable is really what it is. Like, and I think finding, you know, when people say pound the pavement, what does that mean? It seems like kind of abs it's this abstract thing of like, how do you, uh, and this is the hardest thing. I remember when I was starting off in my career, like right at college, I had no idea what to do, like how to get a job. And I ended up having to like work in a bookstore for a while. And like, it was like a legal temp for like a year and a half until I kind of did these things. But you like figured out who to talk to. And it was, it, it started for me, it started off like family friends, someone who like worked in advertising. And I talked to me, said, you have no portfolio. No one's going to give you a job. You got to go take some classes. And so it's like, okay, that was not what I wanted to hear, but good advice. So I went. until I had some work to show, I couldn't really talk to anyone. Once I had some work to show, people said, huh, you know, what? maybe I'll, I could hire you for an illustration. And so I built an illustration portfolio. And I had a very, I don't want to say haphazard, it wasn't a very traditional career. I mean, I started off doing, um, you know, I was like basically working in a bookstore right out of college, temping at night, and then had a couple of days where I was just going around um, trying to, like, talking to people, trying to figure out what to do. And then after I got a little bit of focus, I took some classes, put together a specific graphic design portfolio, got some skills, computer skills, and then got some got an internship and then you know where i basically said look i really need to get a portfolio i will i'm begging you to like let me work for free for a little while <laughs> and so part-time and someone took me on and uh he actually had a master's from yale and he taught me graphic design like from the ground up at a very rudimentary level but enough that i could go in and get a job during graph doing some sort of graphic design so, um, you know, it's, uh, everyone's path is different, but, um, I, I actually don't know the, um, it's, it's a good question because I ask myself this a lot, like, how does one network when you don't have the opportunity to meet anybody? Um, and I think that's the question a lot of people ask themselves right now. So I'm going to encourage everybody that um, if that's a fear that uh, GDC, CGRAF, all the conventions they have, they're, they're going virtual and they provide networking opportunities. So definitely take advantage of those. And for the alumni or that are currently going to the college, I would look at LinkedIn and take a look at your college and who the alumni are because they're a huge resource. They actually, you, The key is to find a connection with them. So because let's say they went to Ohlone and you reach out to them, even if it's cold, you can say, hey, I'm an alumni lonely student, they already are invest, they already have a connection with you. So they might expend, uh, spend more time with you just because of that. And the biggest thing is not asking for a job. That's the one that you don't want because you'll get an immediate no. What you want is feedback. And that's a lot easier for people to give back. So don't say, I want a job. What you're saying is like, I'm still learning. Would you please, if you have the time, can you please give me some feedback? And a lot of the times, if they have the time, they'll say yes. And it's okay if they say no. Because, you know, you don't know what's going on in their life. But uh, some people will say, yeah, yes, just like Jeff said, he would probably say, yeah, yes, no one's actually done it to him yet. Um, but if he did, he probably would consider it. So uh, well, we are really good advice because alumni are going to be. I'm sorry, we are about to run out of time. Uh, Ken has a quick question. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh Make it quick. <laughs> I have to set it up though as well. I don't know anything about gaming. Okay. That doesn't mean I'm not interested uh, in some information. So I got to set this up. Like, you know, on a Likert scale from one to 10, people know about that. Mike, I'm expecting an answer of 10, but on a Likert scale of one to 100. So I really love languages and I can spend all day studying a language. I'm wondering if you, and I just realized that Monica, mm -hmm might be able to help me too, know of any real basic program of animation that could be manipulated by somebody like me who don't know a lot about all that stuff, where I can change it into motions that I can put language action into and develop my language skills. So real basic program or something like that is what I'm wondering about. Uh, 
it's, I mean, the problem with animation, unless you're like, what I would do is I would start with 2D. I would get, so there's a lot of like free 2D animation programs. Start messing around with 2D because it's, in, it's instant quick communication and it gets you like motion and feel really fast. Um, once you get into computer animation, it's technical. It's not intuitive. It's, it's like half computer science, not even computer science. It's just half a lot of nitpicky details. Like if you're animating a character, so think about how many bones you have in your hand. So if you're drawing it, you can do this like pose like this. If you're posing it, you have to go tink, 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 like that to get like that shape. And so it's a lot slower, it's a lot less intuitive, it's a lot more mechanical. Um, whereas 2D is, you know, you draw a line, you draw a shape. It doesn't even have to be perfectly detailed. It's as long as it feels like that shape. So that's what I'd say. That's, yep. you know. I think uh, Aloni does provide 2D animation classes. And another class you may consider is motion graphics, Ken. It does use something called After Effects. Uh, it is a computer-based software, but um, it will kind of teach you how to create like motion that you may be able to translate into language. Great. And um, Jeff, I know we're running out of time. Is it okay to answer one more question? Of course. Thank you so much. This is from Tim. He says that going back to Wild Beyond, you said that you couldn't get the details down because then they would end up looking so small and mobile. So what do you do to make sure those parts more distinct, visible, like color shapes, et cetera? Um, I didn't do anything with the colors or shapes. I'm just doing motion. So my job is really specific. Um, so um, uh, sometimes it's a lot of... Um, making the motion bigger. So actually, that's one of the things. Sometimes you have to do the appro appropriate amount of motion for whatever. So I would say I call it the motion style. So if you have like this tiny character, maybe he's like hopping around as he walks. Um, because if it's just like a realistic walk cycle, like viewed really small, you're not gonna really see it. So it's basically making it readable, like doing what you can to make the motion readable. Um, the other challenge was there's so many things and there's like a hundred things on screen um, and they're all kind of like popping around. It gets kind of vibrating. So you have to kind of, for games like a Clash of Clans type thing, you'd have to kind of like dumb them down because you're doing motion with like lots of patterns. So if it's like a swarm of bees and they're all doing crazy things, it gets too distracting. So um yeah, you, there's not much you can do other than try to like make it readable. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. You You're were so full of information and knowledge, and uh, your demo reels just speak for your for itself. Well, thank you. Um, we really appreciate it that you took the time to see us. Um, everybody, thank you so much for coming and asking such really great uh, questions. Uh, Samuel over here says, thank you for the presentation. You can see the list of thank yous. Um, um, if you guys want to keep in contact with Jeff, you can find him in LinkedIn. Um, and of course, he's got his own personal website. But uh, keep an eye on his Golf Mermaid game. And, <laughs> and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so thank you. much. All right. Take care. Take care, Jeff. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Take right, care, guys. everybody. Good chatting with you.